Welcome to the Rancher Mirage Public Library. My name is Susan Cook, and I am the principal librarian at this wonderful facility. Um, how many of you attended Michael's performance at the McCallum over the last couple of days? <laughs> Clearly, that was a great program, and today we are fortunate to have a lecture by Michael here at the library. Um, and I do want to acknowledge our Library Foundation members who are here. If you could stand up and take a wave to the audience. I saw quite a few of you come in. Thank you for all you do for the library, for our events, and our, our collections. And, uh, oh, cell phones. If you could please silence your cell phones. Very important. Don't want to forget that. Mine is off. Um, on behalf of the City Council, the Rancho Mirage Public Library Foundation, and the library staff, we are so pleased to have the wonderful programs that Sunnylands shares with us. Our working relationship with Sunnylands has brought us lectures of great intellectual quality, with significant presenters bringing our audiences ideas that are very important. We have a working friendship and partnership with Jeff Cowan, Jeff Baum, Janice Lyle, Susan Davis, Ken Chavez, and all the people at Sunnylands. Today is a very special event, and we thank Sunnylands and the McCallum Theater and Mitch Gershenfield for bringing us Michael Feinstein. It is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Cowan, president of the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Susan, and thank you to all of you for, who come out here. It's, it's such a delight to see such an intellectually curious and excited community as we have here. And this is, as you see our branding, by the way, we're never totally shy. This is the 50th anniversary, as we see it, of Sunnylands, of the first time that the first visitor came to Sunnylands. The first uh, President Eisenhower, President Mamie Eisenhower, came in March of 66. So we're celebrating 50 years of amazing achievements at Sunnylands and 100 years of the remarkable Frank Sinatra. So this partnership, we think, is fabulous. And we've loved our partnership with the Public Library, which has been so terrific. And please tell David, we hope that he's well very quickly. Uh, and we've loved our partnership with McCallum and Mitch. It's just been such a treat. And there are three pieces to this event. Uh, you know about the concert last night that Michael Feinstein did. You know that he's giving a lecture, not a performance. This is a prop. It's not a performance piece, it's a prop. He's giving a lecture about Frank Sinatra and maybe we'll hear a little about Frank Sinatra even at, 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 uh, in Rancho Mirage. Uh, but this morning, we saw a different dimension of Michael Feinstein and I wanna tell you about that because I think it's gotta, to me it was moving and I think it would be to all of you. And that is Michael Feinstein, the teacher. You know that he's the ambassador for the American Songbook. You know that he's the man who has preserved it and continued it and added it. Some of you may not know that he's created something called the Songbook Academy, in which he teaches wonderful young people to carry on and build on this great tradition. Well, today at Sunnylands, Michael Feinstein himself, with two of his young protégés, but Michael himself, taught a group of students, how many were in the room, maybe 60 in the room or something, from local high schools to themselves become masters of the American Songbook. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most exciting experiences to be in a room with somebody who has not just done all the other things you know, but is a wonderful teacher. So please, on behalf of a grateful nation and world, please join me in welcoming Michael Feinstein. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I had to run up here, try and get up here before the applause stopped. So <laughs> it's, it's my great pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon. Irving Berlin many years ago once said, history makes music and music makes history. And I consider the Great American Songbook an important part of our collective history. And it has given me a wonderful life, a wonderful career, and the opportunity to connect with people in a very special way. So uh, it's, it's fun to have this experience to be able to speak to a captive audience about uh, things that are very 
close to my heart. Frank Sinatra is unique in the history of American popular music. There are many great singers who have uh, performed these songs that we now call the Great American Songbook, or as some people call it, the Rod Stewart Songbook. <laughs> and just want to see if you're paying attention, and some of you are not. <laughs> I've already put you to sleep. I'm sorry about that. Many people have done sublime interpretations of American popular song. But Frank Sinatra was unique for a number of reasons. For those of you who just know him as this extraordinary voice, uh, as my tribe would say, Dianu, it'd be enough. <laughs> However, Frank Sinatra was a man who got very, very deep into his art in interpreting American popular song. Many singers would go into a recording studio and they would have a lead sheet handed to them. They would sing the song. The producer would say, thank you very much, and they would leave. Frank Sinatra was involved in every aspect of his recorded legacy. He would work with an arranger on the orchestration before he got to the studio. Sometimes that was a very long and arduous process as he would hash over how he wanted the song to be interpreted. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> Rin Tin Tin has joined us for some comments. Uh, Sometimes Frank Sinatra would reinterpret a song completely, so it was, it was not only fresh for him, but it was fresh for all of its listeners. He would sometimes take a ballad and turn it into a swing number or vice versa. So after he would work out what the arrangement was going to be with Nelson Riddle or Billy May or Neil Hefty or Axel Stordahl or any of the uh, dozens of other arrangers with whom he worked through the years, then they would go to the studio. And in the studio, he would listen to the balance of the orchestra, he would listen to the orchestration, he would very carefully go over the whole thing and he would make changes. He would sometimes say, oh, we've got to change this note, give this solo to another instrument. He would sometimes change it around, sometimes not. But he had ears that every musician that worked with him said was extraordinary. He could hear things in the orchestration and in the orchestra that sometimes the arrangers who created the arrangements could not hear. He was dazzling in that way. And so he would sometimes change the seating or work on the acoustics. It was so important to him to create this perfection of his art. And sometimes he would get to the recording studio and he would start to sing and say, you know, it's, it's just not happening. He would dismiss everybody, he would pay for the recording session, and then he would call them back on another day. Sometimes he would start to sing a song and he would say, well, I don't like this arrangement, let's, let's, let's put it aside. Sometimes he would record songs over and over again. He was that exacting in what he did. And the interesting thing is that when he made a movie, he was the opposite of that. He had little patience for being on a film set and, and acting in front of a camera. And so he would do one or two takes and he would take off. And it, it always intrigues me that this is the man who would sometimes spend days, if he needed to, to perfect a recording, and then when he was making a movie, he didn't seem like he cared at all. He was supposed to be the lead in the film Carousel, opposite Shirley Jones, and he left the film. The reason that he left that film is because in, at that period in Hollywood history, they had just invented CinemaScope, and not all theaters had the, wide, the widescreen process. So for a period of about a year, the Hollywood studios would film a movie twice. They would film it in widescreen and they would film it in regular format. And that meant that every actor, every person had to do two takes. They were making two movies at the same time. They'd have to do the widescreen version and the small screen. And as soon as Sinatra found out that it was essentially making two films and he was gonna have to do double takes everything, he left. He walked off the set of Carousel and it never happened. So, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra is this gentleman who very carefully crafted his art. People say that he was the greatest voice of the century. I don't know if he was the greatest voice. He very well could have been. But to me, he was one of the greatest interpreters of lyrics. Frank Sinatra said that it always began for him with the words. It always started with the words because the words taught him how to interpret the music. The words explained to him what he was going to have to do with 
the rest of it. And he always acknowledged the composer and lyricist of the numbers when he would sing them in concert. He would talk about the arrangers. He acknowledged all of his collaborators in a way that was extremely generous and, again, unique because he didn't care if the audience didn't care who did this arrangement, but he wanted them to know, and he made us all into intellectually curious about those things because often I don't think people even thought about such things before Frank Sinatra came on the scene. Now, from the beginning, he was always singing the Great American Songbook. And when he first began his career, many of the songs that he sang were already 10, 15, 20 years old. And so he had to find a way to make these songs fresh. He would do it through the lyrics, of course, by figuring out how he could get a fresh interpretation of it. But he also started experimenting with the accompaniments. The Frank Sinatra of the late 1930s as a big band singer is different from the Frank Sinatra band singer of a few years later in the 1940s. Then when he goes solo, he starts to swing a little bit. And then by the end of the 1940s, when his career was in a decline, he had a fallow period. And then he was signed to Capitol Records in the 1950s. Alan Livingston, who was the head of Capitol Records, recalled that he got a phone call one day from an agent at William Morris this agent had called every record company trying to get a record contract for Frank Sinatra, but Frank Sinatra was considered dead in the water. He was dead in show business in that moment in his life. And so Alan Livingston takes this call from this William Morris agent, and he said, would you be interested in signing Frank Sinatra to make a record? And Alan Livingston paused for a moment, and he said, yes. And the agent said, you would? <laughs> Alan said that the guy was so blindsided that they were interested in him that he, that he lost his composure. And so Alan is the guy who suggested that Frank Sinatra work with this young arranger under contract to Capitol Records named Nelson Riddle. Frank had never heard of the guy, but he made a, a couple of records that were arranged and conducted by Nelson Riddle, and he took a second look and a third look and said, he said, you are something. Then he sat down with Nelson Riddle and he said, he said, Nelson, I want to find a new way to interpret these songs. He said, I want to find a way of freshening them, making them sound ageless. And Nelson said that he spent two days with Frank Sinatra where he was at the piano, Nelson was at the piano, and they were, dis they were discussing different rhythms, different styles, and how to take a song that was 20 years old and make it sound new, but also be respectful with it. And finally, after those two days, Frank said, well, you know what I mean, you work on it. And so that's what Nelson did. And then he came in for the next session, which I think was uh, I've Got the World on a String, and suddenly everything changed because Nelson Riddle created a swing style that allowed Frank Sinatra to sing a ballad with a, a rhythm going on beneath it where he could sing smoothly and it had an energy that people had never experienced before. Then everybody started copying that, that style that Frank Sinatra had created with Nelson Riddle and a lot of singers suddenly found that they were obsolete. Bing Crosby, who was one of my all-time favorite singers and whom I'm going to, be paying, to whom I'm going to be paying tribute in London this coming Friday in a two-hour concert, is a guy who was Frank Sinatra's favorite singer. Bing Crosby's favorite singer was Al Jolson. There is a lineage that, that comes up. Now you see, when Bing Crosby started singing professionally in the 1920s, Al Jolson was the reigning star of show business because Al Jolson could sing in a theater or a vaudeville house without a microphone. He projected and he had an energy and he had a charisma that to this day, people who saw him say is unequaled. So Crosby was influenced by that theatricality of Al Jolson, but then Crosby came along at a time with the invention of the microphone. The microphone came into general usage in 1926. Let's say that's when it really became uh, regularly used for commercial recordings. That's the year that Bing Crosby made his first record. So Crosby was one of the first people to be able to sing intimately with a microphone. Instead of Jolson going, let me sing a funny song with Travis. Crosby would sing, let me croon a funny song. He could sing intimately and he knew that the microphone would capture that. So Crosby was this transitional figure that 
created this new intimate style of singing, but there was a certain reserve in the way that Bing Crosby sang. Bing Crosby never liked to sing the words, I love you. He felt that it was too on the nose and too mushy. So songwriters that wrote songs for Bing Crosby would always try and write him songs that were love songs that expressed love in a sort of sideways way or a subtle way. For example, the song Moonlight Becomes You. Moonlight becomes you, it goes with your hair. You certainly know the right thing to wear. Beautiful song, but the only, word, the only time the word love is used in it is towards the end where he sings, Crosby sings, if I say I love you, I want you to know. So he still isn't saying it directly. <laughs> well, eventually, Frank Sinatra supplanted Bing Crosby for popularity in show business. And in that period, Bing Crosby said, a singer like Frank Sinatra comes along once in a lifetime. Why did he have to come along in mine? <laughs> so Frank Sinatra, when he started singing with the bands and then when he went solo, brought not only a further intimacy, but a sexiness and a vulnerability to his singing that was unusual in that time. In those days, however, the 1930s and early 40s, soloists, vocal soloists, were not the stars of show business. It was the big bands. It was Benny Goodman, it was Artie Shaw, it was Tommy Dorsey, and of course, dozens of others, Duke Ellington, you can go down the list. And of course, the band singers were very important, but it wasn't until Frank Sinatra stepped out of being a band singer and went solo, that vocal soloists became more popular in show business and on records than the big bands. So Sinatra is also responsible for that transition. And in that time, he started singing these American standards so passionately and with such a connection to the words that it was like a shot fired around the world and women were swooning and going crazy for him and men loved him too because he had this masculinity. So everybody, everybody loved Sinatra. And of course, when Sinatra came on the scene, there was a big rivalry between, I mean, perceived in the public between Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra. You were a Crosby guy or you were a Sinatra guy, but you couldn't like both of them. You know, that was that whole thing going on. And the press made much of a feud that did not exist between the two of them. So uh, here's Frank Sinatra who has changed the face of American popular singing and he's on top of the world and he is selecting repertoire that is largely formed from the great American songbook. He meets a man named Mitch Miller uh, at, at Columbia Records and Mitch Miller starts trying to get Sinatra to do more commercial recordings because it was great what Sinatra was doing in those days. He was having a great deal of success, but Mitch Miller felt that Crosby had to stay au courant in the songs that he was choosing, and he encouraged Sinatra to record a number of songs that Sinatra later repudiated, saying that Mitch Miller had forced him to sing these songs that he didn't want to actually record. Well, the truth is that from the beginning of his solo recording contract at Columbia Records, Frank Sinatra had complete control over what he recorded. He had complete artistic control. And so in later years when Sinatra said that he was forced to record those songs, the truth is that he actually had the choice and he chose to record these songs because he wanted to have hit records. Uh, because as the 40s went along, Sinatra's popularity eventually uh, started uh, to wane a little bit. And then it started to wane a lot and he became uh, poison in, in show business. Uh, so the, the lineage of Frank Sinatra is sort of stopped cold for a couple of years at the end of the 1940s. Now, uh, to give you a little bit of background about uh, American popular songs before we go back to Frank Sinatra, the great American songbook as we know it uh, is something that consists primarily of songs that uh, I'd say the nucleus are songs that were created in the 20s, 30s, 40s, maybe into the 50s, songs of, of George and Ira Gershwin, of Cole Porter, of Rogers and Hart, of Duke Ellington, of Fats Waller, uh, Hoagy Carmichael. I mean, you can go down the list of these extraordinary writers. And most of these songs were created for stage shows or were created for movies. And the writers 
who penned these songs were usually writing these songs for a deadline. They weren't writing for history or for longevity. They wrote these songs because they had to deliver the song by next Tuesday, you know? And so these songs were ones that all of these writers, all the ones I had the chance of meeting later in their lives and earlier in mine, always expressed amazement over the fact that they had longevity. But they always, created the inter always credited the interpreters for keeping their songs alive. I'd say that most of these songwriters were very grateful for the variety of interpretations that existed with their songs because it is the reinvention of these songs that gives them the, the longevity, gives them legs. Because you can take a song like Over the Rainbow and you can interpret it in a million different ways and it always seems fresh because the bones or the nucleus of the song remain. Now, George Gershwin was a guy who used to love hearing variations on his songs because they lent themselves to jazz interpretations. But Richard Rodgers did not like people screwing around with his songs. He was very famous for that. Don't screw around with my song. And so much so that when Peggy Lee recorded the song Lover, which was a big hit record in the 1940s, Richard Rodgers was steaming. Why? Because Lover was a waltz when he wrote it in 1932. And when Peggy Lee recorded it with Gordon Jenkins, she turned it into this huge lover when I'm near you, when I hear you became a totally different thing. It's a great record. So she runs into Richard Rogers at a party, and she says, hi, Dick. And he just looks at her and he says, it's a waltz. <laughs> and he walked away. He was tough. Richard Rogers was, was very tough. Uh, Mel Torme uh, told me that Richard Rodgers was very upset at Mel Torme's hit record of Blue Moon because Mel took liberties with that recording. And Mel said, how do you think I feel about it when people take liberties with my songs? I said, I don't know. He said, I love it. I said, good, good. Because he wrote a song called The Christmas Song, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire. Well, he said that one day he got a recording of, of the Christmas song Cha 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 by Hugo Winterhalder and his orchestra. <laughs> And I said, well, he said, it was great. He said, it keeps the song alive. Well, it's true that different interpretations do keep the songs alive, but sometimes you can go a little far afield. It's like Mel Torme did a big up-tempo swing version of Send in the Clowns. That's, isn't it rich? Hoom, hoom, hard we appear. Hoom, send in the clowns. You know, I don't think that that did anything to extend the life of Send in the Clowns. But we live in a time now when people don't know the names of the songwriters, as evidenced by American Idol putting up a Chiron recently, uh, Summertime by Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> well, a friend of mine is a voice teacher, and uh, she said one of her students stood up one day and said, I'm going to sing Summertime by Porgy and Bess. <laughs> But you see, these, these songs and these lyrics have entered so much into the public consciousness that they are a part of many generations' lives. There's a story about Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, the two great comic geniuses working together in the 1950s. And Carl wasn't feeling very well, and he went to the doctor. And when he came back from the appointment, Mel said, well, what did the doctor say? And Carl said, well, the doctor said, I've got arrhythmia. And without missing a beat, Mel said, who could ask for anything more? <laughs> oh, I have to tell you something that I witnessed uh, in connection with Frank Sinatra. This is a non sequitur, but it is about Sinatra. In 1988, I had the opportunity to appear at Carnegie Hall in a tribute, a 100th birthday tribute to Irving Berlin. I was very thrilled to be a part of that evening because I was a, a, the new kid on the block, as they say. But it, it, all the, the performers were extraordinary, and they included Leonard Bernstein and Shirley MacLaine and Frank Sinatra, who was in very good form that night. And at the rehearsal, uh, Leonard Bernstein uh, was present, and there's Sinatra across the way. And uh, Lenny, who was drunk, 
uh, he was feeling no pain. He says, Frank, and he goes over to Frank, and he gives him a big kiss on the lips, right on the lips. And Frank said, oh, Lenny, Jesus, why'd you do that? I don't know where that's been. Oh, God, why'd you do that? You know, Lenny, oh, come on, Lenny, oh, please. So I was relating this story to my friend, the actress, Angie Dickinson, and she told me a story about being one day at Ira Gershwin's home, and uh, she enters, and Oscar Levant is sitting there, and she gives him a big kiss, you know, right, a big, right on the smacker, and Oscar said, thanks, Angie, the last time I was kissed like that was Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> so, what is it that Frank Sinatra did with these songs? Let me give you a couple of examples of how he would change something and turn a song into a standard. In 1928, George and Ira Gershwin wrote a song called I've Got a Crush on You. It was introduced in a show called Treasure Girl, sung and danced by Clifton Webb and Mary Hay when Clifton Webb was a song and dance man. It was a fast-paced dance number went like this, I've got a crush on you, sweetie pie, all the day and nighttime, hear me sigh. Well, the, the show Treasure Girl closed after 30 days, and the song was not recorded, it was obscure. Then, some 20 years later, Frank Sinatra takes this up-tempo Gershwin song, gets an idea to slow it down, turn it into a ballad, and sings it sexy. I've got a crush on you, sweetie pie. All the day and night time, hear me sigh. Well, the song became a huge hit. And when Ira Gershwin, who had survived his brother George, who had passed away, heard the song, he was perplexed because in his mind, the song was still an up-tempo thing, and he wasn't sure that he liked the Sinatra recording. But then he listened to it again, and he listened to it again. And then he realized that the lyric that he had written, could you coo, could you care for a cunning cottage we could share, that was supposed to be sung, could you coo, coo, it worked beautifully as a ballad. And he always credited Frank as being a person who saved a song that otherwise would have been completely obscure. And sometimes Mr. Sinatra would take a song that was a ballad, and he would do it up-tempo. For example, The Way You Look Tonight. The Way You Look Tonight was a hit song in 1936 introduced by Fred Astaire. But when Frank Sinatra sang it in the late 1950s, he did it as a swing number. Someday when I'm awfully low. And the songs are so great, they withstand all of these changes for the most part. The thing that bothers me, though, is that somebody will come along and they will copy the Frank Sinatra up-tempo version of The Way You Look Tonight. They might not even know that the song originally was created as a ballad. And as Oscar Levant said, imitation is the sincerest form of plagiarism. <laughs> These songs, for me, only get better with age. And I think one of the remarkable things about the world now is the fact that with YouTube and technology, we can go back and we can look online now and we can see great performances of these songs that I never knew existed because there are hundreds of thousands of things on YouTube. So I am more amazed today than I was when I started about how these songs have lasted and will last. Uh, I have been involved in an organization that Jeffrey mentioned called the Great American Songbook Foundation. And one of the things that we do is have an annual high school academy for high school kids from all over the United States. And to meet these young people who have a connection to these songs and to these lyrics is quite extraordinary because it doesn't necessarily supplant their interest in contemporary music, but it is something that goes alongside because they experience a very different emotional uh, uh, coming of age, if you will, with these songs that express a different part of themselves that, that one doesn't hear or feel in contemporary music. And also in contemporary music, uh, young people hear a recording and it is 
such and such by Adele or by Madonna. It's a specific performance of a song and they don't hear that song performed by anybody else. These songs are performed by many, many different people, the standards, and that is why they survive. And indeed, Frank Sinatra would take a song and he would re-record it through the years as times changed. A song like Night and Day, which was the first solo recording that he ever made, is a song that he recorded five times. He recorded it as a ballad in 1942, and then he recorded it uh, as an up-tempo swing thing. He recorded it with a, with a Latin tempo. Later, he did a disco version that he came to repudiate. And, uh, you know, these things happen. It is the, the malleability of these songs that is so fascinating to me. Now, Frank Sinatra famously retired uh, later in his life, but he couldn't stay out of the game because he was hearing contemporary music that moved him, and it brought him back. And when he came back for the rest of his career, he recorded not only the classic American popular songs, but was constantly championing and introducing new songs of that time. And he would always introduce these songs as being by so-and-so or so-and-so. Uh, he used to uh, make fun of Marvin, Marvin Hamlish's name. This is a song by Marvin Hambone, Marvin. <laughs> but then he would sing the way we were beautifully, or the other songs that he introduced by these people. There are quite a number of contemporary recordings by Frank Sinatra, when I say contemporary for him, the last 20 years of his recording career, that are the only recordings of some of these songs by great, great songwriters that otherwise would have fallen through the cracks. Now that's not to say that he didn't have his misfires with songs or uh, interpretations that are perhaps not as sublime. For example, the song uh, recorded by Simon and Garfunkel from The Graduate, written by Paul Simon, Mrs. Robinson. Frank Sinatra did a swing version of Mrs. Robinson, which in theory seems like a very good idea. But perhaps Frank became a little bit too hip with that recording because at one point he sings, how's your bird, Mrs. Robinson? Well, Paul Simon, the author, heard this song and got so angry that he threatened to sue Frank Sinatra for the recording until a couple of his friends said, you don't want to do that. <laughs> he said, why not? Well, he said, oh, okay. So he decided he was not going to sue Frank Sinatra for, uh, for uh, monkeying around uh, with his song. I had the great pleasure of knowing and meeting Frank Sinatra. He was very wonderful to me, actually, and I'd like to tell you uh, how that came about for me. And it's one of the reasons that I am very happy to speak, speak about him today, because he was kind to me uh, in a period of my life when, in the words of my grandmother, I was just a schlepper, you know? Um, I had uh, moved to Los Angeles from my home t hometown of Columbus, Ohio, and was trying to make my way as a performer. Uh, I was not setting the world on fire. I had met and had started to work for Ira Gershwin, but I was trying to create some kind of career as a performer, playing the piano and singing. And I was doing okay, but not great. And one day, the phone in my little studio apartment rings, and it's a man from Chasen's Restaurant in Hollywood asking if I was available to play a private party for Frank and Barbara Sinatra. And I said, well, let me get my book. <laughs> you know, I didn't say that, no. I said, yes, 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 yes. Well, I negotiated a low fee to make sure I'd get the job. I wanted the job, I would have paid them, you know? So I got the job, and after I hung up, I started thinking about the reality of what was to come, that I was going to be in the presence of Frank Sinatra, and even though I would be p playing background music, I wanted to try and evolve some kind of way to get him to notice me. So I decided I was going to learn every odd or obscure Frank Sinatra song I could get my hands on. I learned songs from movies that I later found out he wished he'd never made. I mean, I learned songs from like The Kissing Bandit. I mean, you know, songs that he didn't want to know about. But anyway, two weeks later, I got, uh, that was the night of the party. I got to Chasen's early. I was installed in the back party room and uh, just sat down at the piano, just started noodling, waiting for someone to arrive. And then uh, about three minutes later, the Sinatras arrived, they nodded, they sat down, then their guests started arriving. Well, this was the most terrifying group of people that I'd ever played for, because these were all very famous faces, and it was so scary. Don Rickles, uh, Johnny Carson, 
Dinah Shore, Henry Mancini, uh, Gregory Peck. I mean, the list was amazing. And, and so uh, I was a, li a little unnerved, you know, but I kept playing these songs. And every time I would start to play another one of these obscure songs of his, he would look at me. <laughs> and I wasn't sure what effect I was having on him, but I knew I was, you know. So this is the, this is the, the face that he made. And I start to play. So I didn't know what was going to happen. But after about an hour, he got up from his table. He came over to me and with those piercing blue eyes, leaned over the back of the piano and said, Jesus, how do you know all those songs? How old are you? Twelve? <laughs> and he said, kid, come on, sit down. And he invited me to sit at his table. And he started telling stories. The first story that he talked about, the first story that he told was about the movie On the Town. And I don't know what led us into On the Town. Maybe I'd played something from On the Town. I don't know. But he was lamenting the fact that the producer at MGM, Arthur Freed, had cut a lot of the songs that were in the Broadway version and cut them out of the movie and had new songs written. And Sinatra said, to this day, I regret not being able to sing Lonely Town in the movie, he said, with Gene doing a ballet. He said that, that effing Arthur Freed wouldn't allow me to do that. And I could see how he still had great regret over that after all these years. He felt that was such an important missed opportunity. Well, after that night, he and Barbara invited me over to their home for dinner, and I would go and listen to him talk about his work. I didn't care about the tabloid stuff. I was interested in what made him tick. And it was clear that music was the most important thing in his life. He loved women. He loved a lot of things about life. He loved his booze. But music was number one. He loved classical music. His favorite classical composer was Vaughn Williams. He loved opera. He was very wide ranging in, in his musical taste. Um, he told me that his greatest influences, because of the way they sang lyrics, were Billie Holiday and Mabel Mercer. Mabel Mercer was a woman who, at one period, in New York nightclubs, would literally sit at a small table and sing directly to you. She would go from table to table, and she would sing to individuals in the room. And Sinatra said that he never got over that, experiencing that intimacy with her. And he took note of that and decided that he had to try and create that same experience in a large setting. He said that Tommy Dorsey was one of his greatest influences as far as learning how to hold long lines in vocal production. He loved and studied opera. However, he said it was listening to Tommy Dorsey's trombone that taught him about that, those long extended lines. Tommy Dorsey had this way of being able to take in a breath while he was holding a note so he could hold it longer than was humanly possible. And Frank taught himself a version of that to be able to sustain and hold a note forever. Sinatra was not shy about expressing his opinions about other singers because he cared so much about the interpretations of these songs, which were so personal to him. He loved working with Ella Fitzgerald, and he also criticized Ella Fitzgerald, in print even, saying that she breathes in the wrong places and she doesn't always pay, attention, pay enough attention to the words. Well, there were no repercussions for Frank Sinatra saying that as there would have been for practically anybody else. That's because he had such respect uh, from his colleagues. And he would sometimes say things that other people were simply uh, afraid to express. Uh, at the time that I was going over there for dinner, that was when he had been touring with Dean Martin. And then Dean Martin said, I'm not going to continue touring. It was Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, and Frank Sinatra. Uh, Dean was not in great health, but uh, Frank did not take that as an excuse because he felt that singing would make you healthier. And uh, when Dean stopped, I remember him saying, huh, they're going to have to put me six feet under to get me to stop singing because that's what was most important. And if any of you saw him, would run into him in Rancho Mirage, if you'd see him sometimes in a club or, or hanging out, he would inevitably be by the piano or listening to music, and sometimes he would get up and sing. My friend Peter Minton, who played in San Francisco at L'Etoile in the Huntington Hotel, said that Sinatra would come in when he was in town, and he would 
give Peter a big tip and he would keep him playing into the wee small hours of the morning and sometimes he would sing. And it was the most magnific magnificent thing because this was a man who lived and breathed music in a very special way. One of the things that happened with Frank Sinatra, though, in his later years is that he became so stylized that in certain ways he became uh, a caricature. And that is because there was a hipness about him that he didn't have in his earlier years. And some people said that, well, because of his smoking and his lack of breath control, he was singing shorter phrases in the songs and therefore uh, had to affect another persona. I don't know if that's true, but something very telling happened uh, in the 1980s when Frank Sinatra started to work on his first duets album. Uh, he wasn't in the greatest health at that point, and he was approached to do an album re-recording all of his standards, and they wanted him to sing them all the way through, and then they would bring in somebody to sing another part and create duets. None of those duet recordings were done with the other partner in the studio. Frank recorded these songs all the way through, then they took his voice out and they created this, this, these duets. Well, when they took Frank into the studio and asked him to sing all of these great standards that he had sung before, he looked at Phil Ramone, the producer, and said, I have done all these before when I was in much better voice and much better shape. Why am I doing this? And Phil said, this is for a new generation, Frank. This is for people who don't know the older recordings, and this is something that will give you a new audience and a new place in show business. And he said, we're going to take these recordings and we're going to create duets. And Sinatra was very skeptical about it. However, the duets recording that he made, the first volume of it, became his most successful recording in history. So it just shows that the essence of who Frank Sinatra was and is remains timeless. Let's see how we're doing on time here. It's, it's a quarter of three, and there's lots of people in the place. <laughs> I'll just say one more thing about Frank Sinatra before we take some, some questions. To me, Frank Sinatra's place in show business is certainly secure, and all of us who perform revere him perhaps a little bit more than people who listen to him because we gain something special from his art by being able to listen to it and be inspired to uh, create our own interpretations. However, the legacy of Frank is one that I think as time progresses will become more important uh, and even bigger than it is now because the discovery of hearing Sinatra's voice remains an immediate and contemporary experience. And for that, I thank the Lord that he was born 100 years ago and will be with us forever. If I can add to your history on Sinatra, uh, I was a high school student uh, in New York in the 40s, 1940s. And if you, if you uh, were in that time frame, boys and girls would leave school to go to the New York Paramount Theater. Yes. Today they go to lacrosse and soccer. But at this time, frankly, it was a boys and girls activity. And the remarkable thing, frankly, is when you think of Adele and Beyonce with the amplification and the pre-recording, the routine, the protocol, was a movie entertainment, a movie entertainment. So if you started at 10 or 11, you could with stay. 10 or 11 in the morning, then at 1 o'clock, say, if, if Sinatra was the performer, he would come on at 1, he would come on at 4, he would come on at 7 and 10. And you would leave school, and sometimes, if you got lucky, you had a two-hour wait, but sometimes you'd have a four-hour wait. And when I think now of the, the, the in-entertainers that, that need amplification or whatever, that he could sing four or five times a day for about 45 minutes yes. was, was, stayed with me forever, which is why we, we think so highly of you. We've been to every performance at the McCallum, and we were, there la we were there last night, and I got a very personal question to ask you because both my wife and I had the same reaction. There was an extra special dimension last night. 
that I, we've seen you every year, but what was happening with, inside you, it was remarkable. So I got I'm, a bigger check. <laughs> <laughs> you deserved it. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. No, I, I, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that as an artist, uh, hopefully, if we, if, uh, if we are evolving artists, we continue to grow and deepen with what we do. And these songs create the opportunity for further depth and investment. And I think that the longer I work with this music and live with it, my interpretations hopefully go deeper. So I, I thank you for that. Hello. Hi, Michael. My name is Linda Starr. I was Hi. here the day they broke the ground with this beautiful library. So I'm, this is very special to me. It is a beautiful library. It is. And it's wonderful that, there are, that we are all here gathered in it and it is. enjoying it. And I'm on the Arts, Media, and Entertainment Council out here. We want so much for the children to have some of the wonderful things that I grew up with. My mom just turned 92, Libby Starr in the corner. My dad was a songwriter. Happy they birthday They had a recording studio you. in Chicago. So we've always been around the wonderful music entertainment. I, I'd like to find out, because you did talk about that Frank did help you and is there other pe are there other people that helped you along the way that you can share a little bit about? And then... Uh, so you don't want me to mention the people I slept with? To... Uh, no, you can leave that out this time. Okay. All right. And then yeah. also, uh, at the end, when you finish that, could you tell us more about your wonderful academy? Yes. Thank you. People who helped me. June Levant, the widow of Oscar Levant. It was June Levant who I first met when I came to California, who introduced me to the Gershwin family. Uh, June was a wonderful lady whose husband, Oscar Levant, uh, was also a great songwriter. He wrote, uh, most famously, a song called Blame It On My Youth. But I loved him for his witticisms. He said that he knew Doris Day before she was a virgin. <laughs> he, he, he said, he said, what the world needs are more uh, humble, humble, humble people. Hum he said, what we need are more geniuses with humility in the world today. He said, there are so few of us left. <laughs> uh, yes, hello. <laughs> Enjoyed your show Saturday night, but I'm a Lee Wiley fan. Yes. And I understand that Ira Gershwin allowed her to sing I've Got a Crush on You for the first time in public. Is that true or not? Well, she didn't sing it for the first time in public, but she did do the first recording of it ah. for Liberty Music Shop in 1939 with Joe Bushkin at the piano. Joe Bushkin, yeah. So you were quite right at that wonderful connection. Yeah. I'm surprised that she's so undervalued. Well, I think that... One of the things about Lee Wiley is that she was making records. Her, her prime came in a period before stereo recording and tape. And if yeah. she had made more recordings in the stereo era of the 50s and 60s, I think she would absolutely yeah. be a, a household yeah. name. Her recordings with Bushkin and Bobby Hackett. Mm -hmm. Bobby Hackett, and she recorded uh, Someone to Watch Over Me with oh, Fats yeah. Waller on the oh, organ oh, yes. under the pseudonym oh, yeah. Maurice. Right, right. Is that, still, is that record still available to your knowledge? Well, it's in my basement, <laughs> in my collection. <laughs> but yes, I'm sure, I, I, I believe it is. Yes, I Thank believe you. it is. Well, thank you for bringing up Lee Wiley. I know that she also was a favorite of Sinatra's, so. Was he? Was she? Which, yes, she was. Oh, really? She was, so. Smoky voice. But yes. thank you for your performance on today and on Saturday. Thank you very much. You got time for one more quickie? For <laughs> I'd rather answer a question, but that's up to you. Uh, uh, I, 
I was, I was. I'm my, just tired from quickies today. I'm <laughs> a little worn out, but yeah. I, I, from childhood, I was a, a Sinatra freak, and I have every album he made. And then you came along. From and, out of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> and we saw you, my husband and I, when you were sort of starting out, I think, playing mm. in London in uh, the Ritz Hotel, was it? Yes, that was my first engagement at the, at the Ritz. And you were this young, beautiful, young thing. You don't have to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have all your albums, and I was there last night, and I come to see you every time you come. And it's always a joy. And I love the fact that you put together Sinatra and your career this time. It's made a special, uh, as that man said, something magical about the anniversary of Sinatra and you being here at the same time. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I want to thank you. Uh, you remind me. Uh, you, you reminded me when I used to work at Tony's on 52nd Street with oh Mabel Mercer. Of course, that's one of her famous <laughs> and haunts. Uh, I remember I was just a young singer. I'm now 92, so uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> hey, <laughs> you're in great shape. <laughs> <laughs> and no one's chasing me either. Uh, anyway, uh, you brought just wonderful memories, and I remember. After she, you know, she had a lovely farm out up, upstate New York. Was it Brewster? Yeah, or? yeah. Uh -huh. yes. and, and she'd always say to me, kid, you know, you got to get pathos. You got you to you get a lot of experience. And you got to sleep with a lot of people to get that, <laughs> get that out. And I, I you just, just all of a sudden just brought her all out. And thank you very, very much for, Mab for mentioning Mabel Mercer. Well, As a matter of fact, I still have a portrait that uh, I bought in Palm Springs here in a garage sale for 25 cents. <laughs> well, God bless you for, <laughs> anyway, for remembering her as well. Thank, and, and thank and, you for all your shows. You're I welcome. You've even, even been to the one in uh, Pasadena. Yes, I'm conducting. on that in, damn lawn. You know? <laughs> oh, well, thank you for that. Yes, I'm conducting in Pasadena. I, I, I conduct the Pasadena Pops Orchestra, and uh, uh -huh. we're going into our fourth summer season, so yeah. thank you for schlepping there. Yeah. I'm using a lot of Italian words today, so, so, so. Well, thank you so much. Schlep some more. <laughs>